Welcome to today's service. It's wonderful to have you with us today and uh, joining all of the various people who are watching this online. We are not alone. Today our service, uh, the sermon, uh, will be led at Everline by uh, Campbell Moore who is from Christians Against Poverty. Unfortunately, I don't have a copy of his sermon, so I have written something myself as the sermon for our online service. Our call to worship today is from Psalm 98. We join together. O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. We sing together, I serve a risen Saviour. Our prayer of adoration and confession today is by the Reverend Terry Pulaski. We pray. God of the wilderness, who meets us in unexpected ways, who journeys with us, our guide, our hope and salvation. We give thanks for all the blessings of this life. May we love one another as you love us. God, you illuminate the path before us. 
Jesus, beloved, leads us into your truth. May life with boldness, love. We offer prayers for the church universal and all people. May we love one another as you love us. God, you grow in and through all creation, gentle compassion bringing forth new life from the broken places, pruned, made new. May we be the source of new fruit. May our lives birth hope inspired by your spirit. May we love one another as you love us. God of mercy and peace, enfold us in your grace. Release us from our limitations, greed, bigotry, injustice. Prune the vines that bind us. We ask for wisdom and courage, your perfect love to cast out sin. May we love one another as you love us. God, heal us from despair through your gaping wounds. Open us, enable us to have the courage to love. Scarred as we are by the trials of life, we ask for your grace to heal us in mind, body and spirit. May we abide in you as you abide in us. Amen.
We share the peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. And now we sing together, open the eyes of my heart, and Jesus, we enthrone you.
Jesus, we enthrone you. We proclaim you our King, standing here in the midst of us. We raise you up with our Our reading today is from Luke chapter 10 verses 25 to 37, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jer Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while travelling, came near, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think? was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. We pray. Lord, would you guide us into your truth through these halting words of mine and in the power of the Holy Spirit. May our hearts be fertile soil for the seeds of the Spirit to take root and bear good fruit. Amen. Yes, but. Have you ever found yourself saying, yes, but? It's nearly always a precursor to something along the lines of, I'm right and you're wrong. 
Yes, but you haven't thought of this. Yes, but my solution is better than yours. Yes, but it can't possibly work that way. The other thing we can reliably get from the words yes, but, is that in most cases, you haven't actually heard what I said. Certainly you likely heard the words I said, but you haven't heard what I was attempting to convey. What is really happening is that you're attempting to justify your position rather than receive mine. This is exactly what we see in the response the lawyer had for Jesus. The lawyer wasn't interested in what Jesus had to say. He was simply interested in finding fault with it in any way he could. Let's pause with that for a little and have a look at the context for the story. You could imagine that Jesus is in something like a lecture theatre, maybe even a little bit like a church. He's standing at the front following a lecture and the floor is open to questions. It is a hostile audience, and they're looking to trip him up over what he has been saying. That means that every question is designed with a hook in it. Then, a lawyer stands up to test Jesus. Immediately, we're on the lookout for what is about to happen. This is not some innocent question from a curious bystander. It comes with the knowledge that the intent in the question is devious. And that means we need to examine the question to see why it might be a problem. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? On the surface, a perfectly reasonable question. But we know that a good lawyer will always know the answer to the question before they ask it. For the Jews, the answer was that you needed to follow the Torah with all its rules about behaviour. The Torah itself wasn't the problem. The problem was a labyrinth that had been created over centuries to ensure people didn't break the rules of the Torah. The tiniest details were mapped out over what you could and couldn't do. It still happens today. An example, lighting a fire is considered work, and since you're not allowed to work on the Sabbath, you can't light a fire on the Sabbath. Today, that extends to turning lights on and off. Why? because the act of switching has the potential to create an electrical spark that is defined as fire. So to avoid the possibility, you don't turn on lights on the Sabbath. Leaving aside the arguments over the sensibility of this, it is an example of how easily you could be caught out by missing small details. It is likely that this is what the lawyer was angling for. Catch Jesus in a small detail and he could go to town on him. Unfortunately for the lawyer, Jesus takes an entirely different route. Instead of dealing with the massive rules and expectations laid down over centuries, Jesus replies with a question. What do you think? In an instant, the interrogation moves 180 degrees. It is no longer the lawyer attempting to catch Jesus out. It is Jesus examining the heart of the lawyer. The lawyer, not wanting to be caught out by his own trick, answers, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. Immediately, we see that the lawyer had come up with his own answer, prepared as part of the trap. He knows that there is no way anyone could possibly fulfil all the details built up over centuries, and that there was really only one reasonable response. Then Jesus springs a trap of his own. He knows that the lawyer has this answer down pat. He also knows that having an answer and following through on the implications of that answer are two different things. He can see that the lawyer is not actually interested in him or anyone else inheriting eternal life. It's entirely possible, given the various religious stances of the Jewish parties, that he doesn't even believe that there is such a thing as eternal life. No, the lawyer is only interested in catching Jesus out on something he says, which means he's completely unprepared for Jesus' next words. You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. It really is rather funny if you care to ponder it for a moment. The lawyer, standing there having expected to put Jesus on the spot, finds him put rather uncomfortably on a spot himself. 
This wasn't supposed to be about him. But now everybody is watching him and waiting for his next response. How can he answer without giving an even deeper hole that he already finds himself in? So we come to the famous line. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbour? By now the audience must be on the edge of their seats. Jesus versus lawyer. First the question. Good question. Plenty of potential for upset. Score 1-0 to the lawyer. Then the reply question. Ah, getting interesting. Nice return. Score one all. The answer. Good answer. Right down the party line. Score 2-1 to the lawyer. Oh, massive reply. Going to be hard to return this one. Score two all. Weak response. Looks like he's rolled over here. Score two three. Game still on, but not looking good for the lawyer. Good story in response. Leaves the lawyer with little to work on. Score two four. Now the lawyer concedes the next point. The story has backed him into a corner. Score two five. And Jesus doesn't leave it there. Go and do likewise. Home run. That's a six. A slam dunk. Score. You're out of here. The problem the lawyer faced is that he brought legal arguments to a faith table, which is a little like bringing a knife to a gunfight or a cake mixer to a flower competition. Entering the kingdom of heaven isn't about whether you follow a list of rules and regulations. It is about faith. We're told in Romans 4 that Abraham trusted God to set him right instead of trying to be right on his own. Hebrews 11 reminds us that without faith it is impossible to please God. In Galatians 2 we read that we are not set right with God by rule keeping, but only through personal faith in Jesus Christ. The truth the lawyer had lost sight of was he had no way of justifying himself before God if all he brought were rules and regulations. He knew full well that it was impossible to follow all the rules. It's why he asked the question in the first place. His mistake came in missing the fact that not only could Jesus not follow all the rules and regulations, neither could he. And worse, even if he could follow them all without faith, it meant nothing. I want to leave us on this note. James reminds us that faith without works is dead. When Jesus tells the lawyer to show mercy, he's asking the lawyer to begin from the rule of faith and to measure all his actions by that rule of faith. It doesn't mean that he will get everything right in the process. We know Abraham certainly failed in that respect. Yet, through acting in faith, even making mistakes in faith, God responded with love, grace, and mercy, and justified him through that faith, just as God does for each of us. We pray. God of our faith, who sees our hearts and knows that we deserve nothing, yet gives us life. We confess that we often attempt to justify ourselves, to ourselves, to others, to you. We try to attach blame to others, point out failings in others, all to deflect from our blame and failings. Gift us, we pray, with faith that works itself out in love and mercy toward ourselves and others. Let us learn from the lawyer that it is not about who our neighbour is, but rather how we treat that neighbour that it is not about them, but about us, that we are measured not by the actions of someone else, but by our own actions. Help us to show mercy to our neighbours and to ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We sing together, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You. Sister, let me serve you, let me be as Christ to you, 
Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. We are pilgrims on a journey, we're companions on the road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and bend alone. I will hold the Christ light for you in the night time of your fear. I will We bring our prayers for our gifts and offerings. We pray. God of unimaginable love, we've known of your caring since we were babies in our mother's arms. We've been told the stories of your love and we've sung songs about your love. These things bring us comfort. What challenges us is the command of Jesus as I've loved you so you should love one another. Not just those who think as we do, pray as we do, look the way that we do. Help us through our giving, our living and our loving to live up to the challenge of loving as you would have us love. In the name of our risen Saviour, we pray. Amen. We bring our prayers for ourselves and others and as we go, I will leave space for you to pray your own prayers And at the end of each section, I will pray the words, Lord, in your mercy, and invite you to respond with, hear our prayers. We pray. God, we bring our prayers this morning for the country of Argentina, suffering economic failure as the effects of the pandemic devastate the lives of the poor and even the middle class. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We bring before you the great power tensions, China, US, Russia, 
an unnecessary and untenable longing to be greater than, better than, that leads to economic barriers, clandestine war, and possibly real war, all of which is to the gain of the powerful and comes as great cost to the poor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For people in New Zealand who have no or unsuitable housing, who are facing cold, damp winters, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For the people and ministry of Western Church, as they ponder how they deal with their buildings, as they think about where they are headed as a congregation, for their leadership, and for all of those who are part of the decision-making teams. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For our own particularly those suffering loss, those unwell, those separated from loved ones, for our pets. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We bring all of these prayers and our private prayers to the, in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us how to pray. Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, Will You Come and Follow Me?
And so as we go out from here, may we go as a people not looking to justify ourselves, not looking to make it about rules and regulations, but a people who love, a people who work and live and behave in faith, faith that is a gift of God and a faith that justifies us without anything required of us. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace, people of God.